perfect. Okay, so um, as I was saying, unfortunately, your book isn't available in Italian, so let's introduce it and let's talk about you for a second as well. So who is uh, Dr. John McDougall when his medical let's say epiphany happened and what exactly changed in uh, his life after that moment? Well, I, I may not be uh, uh, in print in books in Italy, but people can go to my website and there is a section I would guess called Dr. McDougall's Color Picture Book on Food Poisoning and How to Cure It by eating beans, corn, potatoes, rice. Yeah, I remember. So, yeah, I think that's an Italian. So, uh, <clears throat> but I can't think of any other books that we've had uh, translated in Italian. I've, I've had uh, 12 national best-selling books, and we have another one coming out in the spring. Okay. But anyway, you got, you, you really don't want to know who I am. Uh, I'm, first of all, <laughs> first of all, above everything else, I'm a grandfather. Okay. <laughs> uh, of seven grandkids. And I guess that, that orientation is most important for you to understand because uh, <clears throat> after, uh, after nearly 50 years of medical practice and uh, taking care of lots of people, maybe 6,000 people in a residential live-in safe situation, you kind of have to ask at uh, almost 70 years old, what motivates me now? And, uh, you know, because it's been a long time that I've been doing what I've been doing. Uh, I'm a medical doctor. I'm a board-certified internist, which means I take care of adults primarily. Uh, I got my uh, medical training at Michigan State University, and I quickly left Michigan. I don't know how familiar your listeners are with the United States, but this is a cold, snowy I know, very cold. place. <laughs> and uh, Mary and I, uh, my wife Mary and my partner, uh, for almost 45 years now. I, I saw, sorry, I saw a picture of you uh, guys and uh, you met in the university. Actually, we met in an operating room in uh, okay. uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, when I was in medical school. She was a nurse and I was, okay. a, uh, I was a, a training medical student. And that's, that's where we met and we were in Michigan. And we escaped Michigan when we went to Hawaii where I did, um, I did my internship, which would be first year of medical residency training. And I did that for a year. We enjoyed Hawaii greatly. It was a, a wonderful experience. But uh, my experience as a medical doctor was not all that wonderful uh, because I, I, I was too young. I didn't know really what I wanted to do. And so I was uh, fortunate to be at a place in my education where I could quit for a while. And I did, and uh, that changed my life. I uh, left uh, uh, Oahu uh, in Hawaii and uh, moved to the Big Island the big island of Hawaii, and there I, I took on a job as a sugar plantation doctor, which meant I took care of 5,000 people who lived on the sugar plantation uh, in Hawaii. And I did everything. I did everything from catch their babies to do brain surgery in the middle of the night and you know, uh, pronounce them dead when that time came too. So I was a real general doctor. <clears throat> I learned uh, two, three, two important things during that three years as a general doctor. Remember, I was responsible for everything for everybody. Uh, we could refer to specialists, but that was an ordeal too. So the first thing I learned is that uh, what I did for most of my patients uh, was not rewarding for them or for me. Uh, I tried to take care of their chronic illnesses uh, like uh, high blood pressure and heart disease and diabetes and obesity and constipation and indigestion and arthritis and so on. I tried to take care of these problems these people were suffering uh, with various pills and potions that I've been trained to use. And it was obvious to me that these people were not getting better. I mean, very obvious. Uh, so I took it personal. I thought, well, you know, maybe I'm just a bad doctor. And that wouldn't be too hard to believe, considering I had so, so little training at that time. Yeah, and then the next thing uh, that happened, well, after three years of being a bad doctor on the, on the sugar plantation, I left, huh. uh, went back into training to become a board certified internist. But I have to tell you, one other thing happened during those three years as a sugar plantation doctor. I was taking care of first, second, third, and fourth generation uh, Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans. Yeah. And one of the things that struck me was that my first generation patients who had learned a diet of rice and vegetables and fruits and 
you know, very, very, very little meat and no dairy products. My first generation patients who maintained that uh, traditional diet that they learned from their parents and grandparents uh, before they moved to Hawaii, uh, they were in excellent health. They were always trim. They never had diabetes or obesity or bowel problems or multiple sclerosis or cancers of the colon, breast, prostate. I mean, they just were hardworking, healthy people into their 80s mm. and occasionally 90s. Now, their kids who were raised on the Big Island of Hawaii, uh, they became exposed to the Western food. Yeah. And they started getting a little sicker and a little fatter. And uh, I noticed this. And then when you got to the grandkids, the grandkids were just as fat and just as sick as anybody else that I had ever uh, seen as a patient or even as a person. So it became uh, evident to me that diet did have something to do with disease, which, by the way, I was formally taught formally taught in my medical education that diet had nothing to do with disease. It was oh, all, yeah. it was issue, all, uh, you know, uh, you know where your mental state or exercise or, uh, you know, bad luck, but uh, food had nothing. You could eat anything, just eat a variety. You know, well, let's, I, let's I, food be your medicine. You know, it was something that Hippocrate, you know, I don't know in, in English how to pronounce that, but I think that it's so true these days. It's so true. Well, I saw it back at then, and that was uh, 1973 to 1976. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so I at least knew by that time as a young sugar plantation doctor, I was uh, probably younger than 30 years old. Uh, at that time, I realized you didn't have to get sick. Yeah. Uh, you didn't have to get fat as you got older. But uh, what I didn't realize was the uh, real importance of uh, what I learned is that uh, something simple that follows. I mean, it's so it's just so simple. When you stop doing the things that make you sick, you get well. So once I figured out that it was all the rich food, and uh, I'm going to categorize those for you in two two categories. Once I found out it was the rich foods that were sticking in my patients, and that the way they stayed healthy was by, in this case, I just told you about was by eating rice. But you can generalize that to all kinds of starches. You could be in Italy and you could be living on, uh, on various kinds of pastas and breads, which is what the people traditionally ate yeah. in that part of the world as they ate, uh, they ate pasta, I know for sure. And probably there was a time when, because of the part of the world that you're in, that, uh, that the diet was bar barley and uh, you know wheat and yeah. Various kinds of vegetables and dairy and meat were a lot of potatoes. Also, I think in the yeah. war time, potatoes, potatoes, potatoes. <laughs> well, that's good. You know, that was uh, post World War II uh, was some of the healthiest uh, healthiest times in Europe. Yeah, exactly. Because the rich food was gone, and people recovered from heart disease and multiple sclerosis and all kinds of problems. So, in those bad times, the good food was yeah, gone, and, sometimes and the healthy. It's true. Yeah. So about the, the word starch, so of course I know that starch means uh, rice, legumes, uh, corn, and right. potatoes, sweet potatoes, pasta, okay. But um, what do you think about, because in the vegan community they are quite popular, uh, let, let's so-called grain seeds like quinoa, uh, amaranth, buckwheat, and stuff like that. Do you think they are uh, good for in your diet? Because they are full of proteins, you know, like uh, buckwheat, again, millet as well do they find they have a space in your plan or what do you think uh any or all of them <laughs> <laughs> they're all fine foods they've been eaten by uh, various populations of people all that you mentioned as the uh, bulk of their calorie intake uh throughout you know thousands and in fact uh probably hundreds of thousands of years okay. is uh various populations of people we certainly know uh, that people have been eating this kind of diet for over 100,000 years. We have evidence to that. And then if you go back to humanoid, you know, pre-human people, you can see that they're, uh, uh, they were primarily plant eaters, just like, uh, just like the lesser primates are of these days, you know, the great apes, the chimpanzees, yeah. the... Uh, and they're quite the, strong, the so it's not true yeah. that if you're a vegan, you're going to lose your, you know, muscles. <laughs> it's not true. Well, one of, one of the best examples that I share with people about uh, about muscles comes from your area of the world, and uh, probably actually probably comes directly from Italy. It's a 
Uh, as the culture expanded uh, uh, from the Roman Empire, uh, and anybody can correct me on my history, that's no problem at all, but uh, the expansion involved, of course, lots of buildings and aqueducts and coliseums and all kinds of things. And uh, <clears throat> there were a lot of coliseums built in uh, uh, a part of the world called uh, Ephesus, uh, which is uh, today's modern Turkey. And uh, in that part of the world, uh, they made a um, archaeologic finding about, it was about 20 years ago. Are you talking about the barley men? Yeah, the barley men. Ah, right. yeah. No, yeah. No, but go on, please, because I know about that, because but yeah. other people know, maybe not. So go on with that, because it's very interesting. Right. This is a, there's a YouTube presentation about this discovery and uh, a, a lot of write-ups in scientific journals and magazines. And they found a, they found a grave site. Uh, which contained 60 males, and uh, these males had their tools of occupation which, with them, which were swords and sh shields and tridents, and uh, uh, some of them suffered from trident holes in their skulls, and so they quickly concluded that these, uh, these men were gladiators who had lost in battle. And then what they did is they analyzed their bones, and you can analyze the bones and hair <clears throat> of people, and you can tell what their chronic diet is. And so what they concluded was that these barley men, or these gladiators, uh, which have been known as barley men throughout uh, written history, they've been referred to as barley men, uh, they found out that they were vegan, and uh, their diet was uh, mostly barley and some beans. And the reason they ate this way is that they wanted to have endurance and strength in the Colosseum because losing was bad, you know, was, uh, was bad form. You didn't get to come back. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, they've been known as the barley men, and and uh, you know the strongest people in the world, uh, exactly. the, the, you know the greatest fighters, the greatest athletes uh, in the past and and presently uh, live on starch. There was just uh, which marathon was it just last week? Uh, the Kenyans came in first again, or it was Ethiopians won actually. Which marathon? Anyway, there was a uh, maybe it was the oh maybe it was the Boston marathon. Anyway. Uh, there's marathons all the time all yeah, over the today, world. Today is actually London uh, Marathon, so it's is it well? You know, if the Kenyans and Ethiopians are there, which they likely are, they're yeah. going to win. They are, you know, they win all the yeah, longest they win all the time, endurance yeah. they, and and their diet is eighty percent starch. It's mostly corn. Okay. So <clears throat> you know, you have examples of people from the past uh, and athletes of today, and you know, examples of uh, you you mentioned uh, Italy and during the war. Uh, I'm sure the Italian soldiers didn't live on beef steaks and and hot dogs. I don't you know, think they, so. <laughs> their, their their fighting food was likely what was available, which is the wheat, yeah. you know, breads and pastas and so on. And certainly, we know that the uh, the American um, opponents during World War II almost beat us, and they lived on rice, known as the Japanese. Yeah. And then we had something called the Vietnamese conflict, which we lost to rice eaters, uh, the Vietnamese. So. You know, I mean, strength, uh, as, as always, if you look at it, strength and beauty uh, and health have always come from living on starch-based diets. Yeah. And uh, st starch is the, uh, is the part of the plant where the plant stores its energy for its own use, which is for reproduction for, to become anew yeah. during the springtime. It uh, sprouts or um, germinates, whatever seems to be the most appropriate term, sprouts or germinates. In the spring, uh, and it needs fuel, and it gets that fuel from its roots and bulbs and corms that are underground, and it gets its uh, fuel from seeds that are above ground, known as grains and legumes. Yeah. So that's that's what starch is. It's the uh, it's the part of the plant that stores the bulk of the energy. And what people are is people are starch eaters. Yeah. You know, if you had to best describe what the human being is, you say you could say. Well, we're herbivores, or we're omnivores, yeah. or we're carnivores, and people have used all those terms for people. I think at best, you can say that people are opportunistic in the sense that they will they will be act like herb or, or uh, omnivores. They'll eat anything. People will, and we're real good at surviving that. But when you say, well, what is the ideal diet for a person to make them look, feel, function their best, and avoid diseases? That would be an herbivorous diet, plant diet. But you, you need to go further than that you know, <clears throat> because a lot of people try and live on plant parts that won't sustain life like kale or broccoli or cauliflower or lettuce. Yeah. 
or celery. You know, they, they go into this type of a high nutrient dense eating, uh, which is one term they use it, or they become vegan and they stay away from starch. Well, these people quickly come to realize within two or three days that they can't sustain this. Yeah, you know, of course, or they eat a lot of, you know, vegan. Uh, what I realized, sorry if I interrupt, is vegan or plant-based doesn't mean anything because there are a lot of people, they are eating a lot of processed vegan, vegan or processed food like, um, I don't know, full of soy or gluten and stuff like that. So maybe it, it would be better actually to eat a lot of fish and not being vegan if you, if you start to eat that way. So... Uh, I, I wouldn't go that far, but <laughs> no, maybe not. Okay, so uh, but, but you know what I wanted to ask you about. Yeah, this, but, but well, you know, the problem is that. I was like that. There is a huge uh, misconception about carbs because, you know, people have been brainwashed by society and mass media on how carbs are the enemy. You know, I am talking yeah. about a lot of diets that I'm sure you're familiar with, like uh, the Atkins diet, a uh, very high fat or the Dukan diet that I've been doing mm. for a long time, which is super uh, high protein, very low carbs. And because, you know, I was ruining my health, I was not losing weight and, but I was scared of carbs so what do you say to people what do you tell to people that are still you know stuck in that kind of mindset that carbs are the enemy yeah and it's hard you know it's uh these uh, low carb diets uh the atkins diet in our country is the most famous and probably the most famous for you too uh these low carbohydrate diets have been around for you know 100 years yeah. Uh, people are desperate to lose weight. Uh, if you eat these low-carb diets, which are made up of meat and cheese and oil, uh, you will lose weight, and you'll lose weight because you get sick. That's how they work. They uh, put you in a state of ketosis, you ketosis. become ill. Yeah, I yeah. Very, sorry, very, very, uh, what, sorry if I interrupt again, but when I was doing the Dukan diet, you know, my goal was to get in the ketosis state. So can you imagine, you know, the goal was to get in the ketosis state. So how, how, how sick is that? That's yeah, sick. I mean, you, when you, you go into ketosis when you're sick, you know, yeah, that's, exactly. that's part of being sick. <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, they, they have uh, the low carb movement has uh, made a big impression all over the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can go, I was in India and uh, uh, they were into low carb diets. And, you know, it's, it's made an impression because people lose weight. Uh, they lose a lot of water weight within six to eight. But within a week, they lose six to eight pounds of water. And, okay. and then, uh, you know, the food's easily available. You can find meat and cheese almost any place and it's really easy to eat and put enough salt on it you can get it down anyway they uh... <clears throat> so they've been very popular and uh... uh you, you kinda ask well why have such diets become so popular and well you know there's a a tradition in the u.s. and i'm sure there is in italy too that uh... that poor people don't eat meat rich people eat meat and so if you want to have status you eat meat and cheese i'm sure that's uh... That's a, a worldwide way of thinking. Uh, it's also really uh, easily accessible in terms of our modern world. You can go to these fast food restaurants and just throw away the bun and you're on the Atkins diet or Ducan diet. And uh, the other thing is that we have something called the meat and dairy industry, yeah. which is worldwide. And, and they're very, very interested in people <clears throat> not eating carbohydrate. Uh, they'd rather feed the carbohydrate to the pigs and the cows. So uh, industry is very interested in, uh, in people having this kind of information about low-carb diets. And there are secondary beneficiaries. I don't know that they think about it, actually. But when people go on low-carbohydrate low diets, then hospitals prosper and uh, pharmacies prosper and people who do uh, 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 surgeries prosper and the devices used in the surgeries prosper. So uh, as a side uh, benefit, even the insurance companies, uh, if they're free enterprise insurance companies, everybody profits from people being sick. Uh, okay, I was asking because people is getting, you know, sicker and yeah. sicker. Okay, that's true. Yeah. It makes and if you sense. Go on, and if you go on low-carb diets, you get sick. I mean, that's just the way it is. Well, anyway, you got back to, you know, how do people get uh, over the idea that starch is what they're supposed to eat since it's been so vilified? You know, potatoes have been maligned and misunderstood, even yeah. though Europe lived on potatoes uh, in the 17, 1800s, and as you mentioned, up until the mid-1900s. 
people lived on potatoes. That was uh, basically their diet in Russia and Poland and Belgium and uh, Ireland and so on. I mean, that was the diet. And now, now all of a sudden potatoes are are maligned and misunderstood. Well, <clears throat> now I'd go back and I'd look at your history as we've talked about. We've talked about people. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. We've talked about people throughout uh, uh, human history who have lived on various kinds of diets. And what you must realize, first of all, is that all large, successful populations of people have lived on starch-based diets. Uh, if you look to uh, uh, Central America, you're looking at Mayas and, and uh, Aztecs who lived on corn. These are the people of the corn. If you look at uh, South America, people lived on potatoes, and potatoes were eventually taken to Europe, or I think in the mid-1500s, they first brought them to Europe. And then, of course, they became, they became an important part of the uh, European's uh, economy and diet in the 17 and 1800s. In fact, uh, uh, malnutrition vanished in Europe once the potato was widely introduced. And populations of people like uh, the Irish, the population oh, Irish, of Ireland, yes. Oh, yeah. uh, it doubled. Uh, it doubled during a forty-year period of time when the potato was introduced. So, uh, I mean, the potato changed everything. Yet today, the potato is, is hated as the most fattening and uh, worthless, uh, empty food there is. And that's opposite of what is true. You know, French fried potatoes are not good, or potato chips are not good. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> so you, you have to kind of you have to kind of think about world history. Uh, you also could stop and think about what you really innately like to eat. Uh, I often give the example of my cat, Einstein. Uh, Einstein loves to eat birds and snakes. And he brought a mole to our back door just recently, and he gets mice and rats. And I mean, that's his diet. He just has a great old time with those kind of animal foods. <clears throat> but Einstein would not eat a potato. I don't care what I did with it. He wouldn't eat a potato because that's not his food. Uh, it's the same thing with people. You can't get, get people to eat uh, little sparrows and uh, little rats and mice and snakes and uh, gophers and uh, moles and uh, you know, th things that Einstein just loves. People won't eat unless, unless you, take, you take the feathers and fur off of them. And then what you have to do is you have to cook these animals very thoroughly. And then you have to put salt, sugar, and spice over them to disguise them so that people can eat them. Otherwise, people won't eat those foods. So getting back to what I mentioned to you a couple of minutes ago, I was going to tell you about two categories of food poisoning. Yeah. One category of food poison that uh, your friends, your country, men and women, children need to understand it's one category of food poison, just to make it simple so you can understand. It's which oil. Is, yeah, well, one is oil, but the other one is animals. Yeah. There are two categories. There are animals and oil. So once you get that understood, you say you can't eat animals and oil. Okay. Uh, that's what's killing you and fattening you and giving you greasy skin and acne and so on and bowel cancer. Once you understand that, what happens uh, is people's immediate reaction, at least people that I'm around, they say, well, there's nothing left to eat. You, know, you just took away my entire meal plan. Mm -hmm. Well, then you have to educate them. The other side of the story that we've been talking about is that the human being is a starch eater. If you go to Asia, you're looking at people yeah. typically think of eating rice and and the the uh, part of the world you're from uh, used to be known as the breadbasket of the world. So, uh, you know, those are the kinds of foods that people ate were wheat and barley during and still do. You go... You look at some of the, yeah. and I, this may not be the kind of geography that you think about, but you realize I'm halfway around the world. And when I think of Italy, I think of Greece, I think of Egypt, I think of Syria, I think of Iran, Iraq. I mean, that, 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 that part of the world right now, which is in so many people's eyes because of the turmoil, used to be known as the breadbasket of the world. Uh, that's where people, you know, grew wheat and barley and... Yeah you know, fed the world. 
my, my mom is always telling me that uh, they were eating meat once uh, per week. It was like, you know, a party when they were having meat and mm. they were per mainly eating a lot of legumes and potatoes and stuff like that. And, you know, our grandparents, they were lean, you know, they were leaner than us. But then what happened here as well, you know, dairy and a lot of meat and stuff like that. And actually a question that I had for you, but you kind of replied already, was that we are obsessed, you know, in Italy with the extra virgin olive oil because um you know there is this huge kind of national it's like a national treasure because a lot of people especially they're also doing their own oil they're producing their own oil and they think because of that because it's uh, organic uh, unrefined uh, cold press it is more I don't know, natural and it's healthier than, I don't know, canola oil or, so, or stuff like that. So if you say to an Italian people, if you, if you ask an Italian person to give that up, it would be like very hard. I'm not saying that I don't because now I, I, I'm following actually your advice. I, I don't even buy that because if you buy that, you're having that you're going to use it eventually but um so what would you say to an italian you know person that you know is trying to follow your let's say plan of starch and um not to use the extra virgin olive oil which is basically like you know the the the, 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 the only thing that are always using why don't they're, they're not going to use that anymore they've always been told that it was so healthy all right. Well, you know, things have changed in Italy a lot over the last uh, few years. So the first time I was in Italy was in 1970. And I remember how disappointed I was when I ordered pizza and they didn't put hardly any cheese on it at all. In fact, maybe almost no cheese. Uh, back uh, after World War II in uh, Crete, you know, that's where the that's where the um, where the uh, original uh, Mediterranean diet came from. Uh, they ate the kind of diet that you and I eat with a little bit of extra oil, olive oil. They did have that. <clears throat> so olive oil has been kind of a, a, a treat, a, a richness in the diet of people of the Mediterranean area for a long time. And, it, and as we talked about before, it's been praised as, yeah. uh, as uh, the food that uh, the, the fortunate people get to have. Uh, it, it's It's rich. I know that in this country, uh, a good bottle of olive oil is very expensive. So uh, <clears throat> I think in, you know it provided calories, and I'll, I also know that, uh, or I believe, you can correct me, you know more about your history than I do, that it was something that was uh, uh, kind of a status, uh, something that was you know rich in their diet, was olive oil added, and now of course olive oil is very easy to get because yeah. of. Uh, fossil fuels and transportation and all the things we can do. Anybody can buy olive oil. It's relatively cheap, even low-grade olive oil. Everywhere, yes. Yeah. So uh, you can also, if you go through around the Mediterranean area <clears throat> and you look at the amount of olive oil that people eat, uh, you can make a direct correlation between the amount of olive oil they eat and how obese they are. So it's, 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 you know, it's nothing you wouldn't expect. You know, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. You wear. And if you, if you eat olive oil, then you are going to, you're going to wear that olive oil. Yeah. Because, yes. you know, I, I watched a webinar of yours about nutrition and Mediterranean diet. So um, I, I, I kind of think about your answer. But uh, let's say that the people, they, they don't imagine this because it's hard for Italian people to imagine that. And when I told my mom that I was going to interview you and I said that uh, you said that um, the children in Italy, they were second uh, in obesity just to uh, Greece. Oh, you know? yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're she second. didn't believe me. She was like, it's not <laughs> possible, you know, because the Italian moms, honestly, especially in the south of Italy, they live in denial. They, they, they don't believe that. They overfeed yeah. their children and it's a true story so can you tell me a little bit more about this thing about children in Italy is that true they're becoming really obese well those are statistics that anybody can get off the internet yeah, I know is but... uh, that you look at the fattest kids <clears throat> in the world and uh, Greece is first and Italy is second uh, more than and the, the United States St even more than the United States yeah, yeah I, I, if I can remember this list correctly it's easy to look up just look up the 10 fattest countries with 10 fattest kids on the internet, I think the U.S. was number five. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, Italy and Greece have a speed. I believe Spain has a speed, too. So you are you are feeding your kids well. Uh, I went to, I've been to Italy 
I guess on two occasions, one in 1970 and one in about 1993. And things changed a lot in those 23 years. Uh, but even in 93, I mean, you had to go to the center of the city to find a McDonald's. Yeah, no, that's or, just, or, just true. Yeah, I mean, or a burger, and I bet they're every place now. I would just, I would just guess that every now neighborhood. They are, yeah, they're more common, but uh, it's still in general they're not. You know, for instance, we don't know what Starbucks is or places like that, and it, it's better honestly because uh, if we want a coffee, we just have uh, I don't know. I live in London, but uh, we have small bars and a small espresso with a tiny bit of latte. We don't have the, all those big latte mocha cappuccino which is you know terrible for as you know health and waistline of course but uh, it would be a better place if instead of Mac mcdonald's it would be mcdougall <laughs> that's not gonna happen i know but gonna, you know it, the, uh, the the i think the best we can expect before nature takes her turn uh the best we can expect as people is to uh get the message out yeah. And that's happening, thanks yeah. to you. Uh, and, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, and and that's many, why many I other... wanted to talk about, to you yeah. as well, is, in Italy as well. So, yeah, so people can get the, the, you know, can understand that they're not uh, supposed to be fat and sick and that they, they don't have to be out of control. Uh, the system works just like, you know, your, your, your animals that live in the countryside, they uh, eat the right food and they stay the right body weight and so on. When people get involved, of course, that all changes. But uh, you're supposed to be strong, fit. Uh, you're, you're, you're not supposed to fight with battles of obesity. You're supposed to be able to bear your children naturally. Uh, you're supposed to, you know, stay healthy. Your heart disease is not, uh, you know, not part of the, the human existence if you eat well. There's breast cancer, which I know is becoming very popular in Italy. And uh, <clears throat> so if you, as a... You know, at any age, if you decide that you don't want to keep getting sick and better yet, you want to reverse your problems, uh, what you do is you fix the problem. The problem is the food. Yeah. The problem is, is that you and your family are eating like kings and queens of old. And uh, if you go to the art museums, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about is the rich people. Uh, they could afford to eat all these uh, pies and cakes and, and meats and cheeses and so on. And, and they got fat. Yeah. <clears throat> now I realized that at one time uh, being a little fat was uh, was a, a beauty characteristic. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, it was, and it was, and I, and I do remember vaguely my times going through the museums in Italy and Europe, and and realizing that uh, uh, carrying a little extra weight for a woman was particularly attractive. Well, during those times, uh, women who weren't wealthy were very thin. And it was a, a sign of being uh, a little bit wealthier is to have a you know extra twenty thirty pounds on. So uh, you know maybe maybe in Italy uh, the women want to be fat and, and I don't think so. You and know, that's, the men that's also something it's not, it's not nice to say, but there's also a different difference between sometimes north and south because unfortunately in the south sometimes there is still a lot of um, you know fat way of cooking i have my partner who honestly was really obese when he was you know what you know a child and he lost I, I don't know in pounds but i think in kilos probably 50 50 pounds because his mom is a very nice lady but you know that the kind of mentality of overfeeding children because you love them and you give them too much food and eat 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 so it is really something that maybe in the north of italy it's not is not happening that much and uh, are you still there Yes. Yeah, I'm oh, still here. Yeah, sorry. I only have two t small questions to ask you, and then I'll let you go. One question is just a tiny, a different subject, because um, I think that we are eating too much these days, and a way that I found that was very effective for me to, um, you know, losing weight and, you know, feeling, you know, better, I was a professional athlete, is the uh, intermittent fasting. So I wanted to know what you think, it's a different question, not just always talking about, you know, plant-based diet, and, you know, to have a break from food sometimes, so not always eating breakfast, and I found out that my metabolism, you know, my metabolic rate didn't actually drop, so I was feeling, I'm feeling happy. Healthy. Sometimes, like once in a week, I just don't eat for a day, and I just have a dinner, a light dinner. So, 
What do you think about the intermittent fasting? Do you think it's healthy? Because there are research that are showing that it could also be good for cholesterol and, uh, you know, um, blood sugars. So, Well, you know, they all have to leave that to somebody else. Okay. Uh, I, you know, I'm a food doctor. I just feed people. Okay. And, and when, people, when people eat the right kind of foods, like, yeah. uh, like I've been recommending for 40 years, what happens is immediately, like in, within 24 hours, the indigestion goes away, the bowels start to move, uh, the greasy, oily skin starts to improve, uh, blood pressure start to come down, blood sugars start to improve, I mean, in the first day. Yeah. So, and I do this by feeding. Uh, yeah. And I, and I know uh, you get phenomenal results from fasting. I have friends who are fasting, fasting doctors and, you know, they get great results too. But uh, then what happens is, you know, things continue to improve. People lose who are overweight. They lose uh, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 pounds a month, eating as much as they want. And this doesn't even involve exercise. So uh, cholesterols drop. They'll drop. In, you guys use international units. They'll drop, say, from 7 to 4 international units. And uh, blood sugars drop to normal and type 2 diabetics. And most of our patients get off their blood pressure pills. Uh, they're always their diabetic pills. They get off those. And and uh, you know sometimes they'll need insulin if they're that kind of diabetic, but you can pretty much figure on uh, getting your health back, and getting off your medication and getting your activity level back and uh, looking good if you fix the problem. And the problem is, as I mentioned, it uh, falls in two food categories: so uh, food poisons, okay. and those are animal foods. You just stay away. You don't eat any any cats and dogs and mice and and goats and pigs and you, you just, and even fish. I know, no. I know fish is a, was a big thing in, in Italy. Yeah, I don't know where you get... it was a question, but I didn't want to, you know, to give you too much because, no. you know, the, the fish, it was, is another tradition that we have. And I wanted to know because I was eating a lot of fish because I was thinking, oh, okay, it's fish. So it's not as bad as meat, but uh, just a, a time, what do you think? It, it... Well, first of all, I don't think there are any fish left around Italy. <laughs> you, know, you might you might think about that. I mean, when I went there, they were serving something called tilapia, okay, which in our country is a is, a, is not not a prized fish, at least uh, what we call tilapia. So, uh, fish is fish has basically disappeared from the Mediterranean uh, because of overfishing and uh, pollution. So you don't have any fish. Yeah, you know that's basically it. No, 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 nor do we. I mean, we're losing all our fish populations here too. So it's nothing unique to the Mediterranean, but the Mediterranean was one of the first places the fish disappeared. Uh, fish is, uh, is uh, not only a treasure that we ought to preserve, it's not healthy for you. Uh, if you eat fish, uh, you accumulate uh, environmental chemicals. For example, I can tell how much fish you eat if I test your body for methylmercury. Uh, it's a direct reflection of how much fish you eat is the amount of methylmercury in your body. So it's, uh, it's highly polluted. That's yeah. one of the few salvations of fish. Maybe we'll leave them alone because they're so toxic. Even if you have of, a wild caught, right? Oh, the wild caught is, yeah, just, just as bad. As bad. And right. wild caught is, in, in fact, as far as pollution goes, well, I, I, I couldn't grade wild versus uh, farm fish. But, yeah. uh, but, but, but see, the farm fish are fed wild fish. You know, the, the, the fishermen go out and they net these little fish. And they feed them to the big fish in the farms, and so they get they get horrible amounts of pollution. No, 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 they, they they may be more there. Uh, there's something in my memory that says they're more polluted than even wild fish, the farm fish. But wild fish are so polluted, the wildlife is so polluted that you know in Alaska, oh, okay. uh, uh, the Inuit Eskimo, uh, their uh, their secretions and tissues are uh, considered so so polluted that they're environmental toxins that should be disposed of in, by special means. And uh, a woman's breast milk in uh, that part of the world, uh, up in Alaska, a woman's breast milk, Inuit Eskimos breast milk, uh, has uh, five to ten times more pollution than, uh, say, a woman in, uh, su in southern Canada <clears throat> because of all the meat and sea life that they eat up there and the fish. So uh, you oh. can get very easily. You can get you can get to a, to a point where your 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 mother's milk and uh, your your body tissues are so poisonous that they need to be uh, disposed of 
and uh, by the same way you expose other toxic materials. God, yeah. So, yeah. so you know, fish is toxic, yeah. and it doesn't provide anything that you need. You get all of it from plants. Yeah, no, but I'm glad that you talk about fish because the last question, you know, and you know the pollution, etc. Because the last question was that was, was uh, sorry was actually about the um, something you talk about as well in your book, and it's the um, uh, the Cowspiracy documentary, and I'm I'm sure you you watched that. And uh, did you watch Cowspiracy? Uh, not yet. Uh, no. But I heard, but, I heard anyway, <laughs> but you know, anyway, you know very well what we are doing to our planet, and the fact that a lot of people don't know about how you know intensive farming is actually you know worse than cars and transportation when it comes to pollution. Is that true? You know that, right? Yes, you wrote uh -huh. it in your book, so. Yeah, I know that. It, it, um, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, one of, one of the most uh, respected journals in the world, uh, in March of this year, 2016, they came out and said that if we would go toward a plant-based diet by 2050, which is just, just around the corner for you, you know, uh, by 2050, if we, we tended toward a plant-based diet, we could cut mortality world, worldwide by 10%. We could cut uh, greenhouse gas emissions related to food by 70%, and over half of the greenhouse gas emissions are due to food. So we could have a 70% reduction in greenhouse gases, and also we would save $31 trillion if we would make this change. And of course, the more we make the change, the better those figures look. Uh, yeah, we're we're sitting uh, we're sitting in a situation where we have a choice. As I mentioned later, or mentioned earlier, you know, why do people eat these low carb diets? So, well, one of the things that's going to stop them from eating low carb diets, diets of meat and cheese, and other animals, and so on, is nature. You know, nature is uh, is not forgiving. It doesn't really care about people's political beliefs or uh, what they want to eat by tradition. Uh, nature really doesn't care, and so. With what's happening to uh, your part of the world and my part of the world uh, uh, says uh, clearly that uh, changes are coming. Yeah. And uh, one of the changes that has to come, whether we like it or not, is our uh, production of livestock. This has to stop because um, it is destroying the world. Yeah. And we're talking about the fishing industries, the dairy industries, the meat industries. They're, uh, they're, they're guilty, as guilty, if not more guilty, than the... Uh, uh, than the fossil fuel people, the people who mine coal and gas and you know, it was so so powerful that you know the cowspiracy documentaries, even a, you know people the people in Greenpeace actually they were they were refusing to talk about this and they were, it was such a so sad because you know at the end of the day it's our planet and we, we're supposed to I mean to protect it and instead we are I mean we. I'm not talking about me or you, of course, but these people, they are not doing the best for, for us. And, 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 it's so, and it was so sad. And, and really, I suggest you, of course, when you have time uh, to, yeah. to watch it because it was... Oh, I, yeah, I, 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 I certainly should. I've heard good things about yeah, it. Yeah, it's really good. As well as... Well as uh, and, I, and I've had some input into these, some of these documentaries. But anyway, um, that, that's all good. Uh, we, we, we have an opportunity to change individually and as communities, and we're going to change. Uh, and people, uh, part of that change in terms of planetary survival is we must go back to a starch-based diet. The difference in, <clears throat> in the impact on the environment between eating beef and, say, potatoes yeah. can be as much as 100 times. I know. Yeah. You know, and the amount of food you can produce, uh, say, growing potatoes on the same amount of land as, say, growing beef, uh, it would be maybe 17 times more calories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we have an opportunity here. We just have to get people to understand what the truth is. Yeah. And that is that the human being has been, throughout all of uh, recordable history, a starch eater. There have only been a few exceptions. And those would be like, for example, the Inuit Eskimo I mentioned. And a few other tribes, small tribes around the world have been meat eaters. But otherwise, all, all populations, uh, whether they come from the Middle East or the Far East or South America or Central America or the American uh, Native, Native Americans, uh, you know, all populations of people living in uh, temperate environments, environments not of extreme, have lived and built their civilizations on various starches. 
And now we're in the process of destroying our civilization and becoming extinct. And one of the reasons is, is because we've given up this basic understanding of starch <clears throat> and been fooled into thinking that what we need to eat is a lot of olive oil and meat and so on. Um, you know, uh, the last thing that I'm telling you, because it's, uh, it's actually very, very curious, is that when I posted my picture, when I, you know, that I lost weight and I show you that I lost a lot of weight and, and I told to people that I lost weight, uh, actually switching to a, a plant-based diet where I, would eat, where I was eating starchy food, you know, people was asking me, how are you doing that? It's not possible. You're eating carbs and you're losing weight. And I said, of course, I'm not eating olive oil anymore because because what I understand now is that if I'm eating a lot of oil and if I'm eating a lot of carbs, I'm not get, I'm not losing weight. Of course, it's always a matter, you know, finding a balance. If I'm eating carbs and you know good carbs and good starch, I cannot eat all the amount of olive oils and fats I was used to. I was eating before. Yeah. Well, <laughs> people need to understand that they need to understand that fat, including olive oil, is for storage. Yeah. It's for when it's for when the fam the famine comes. Uh, the body does not convert sugar, even white sugar yeah. or starch into fat easily. And so uh, you're, you're not going to get fat eating starch. There used to be no fat Chinese before 1980. Yeah, that's right. And that's when 90 percent of their diet was rice. So when I was in Italy in 1970, and not that I was that aware of what was going on, but uh, my memories are of all trim people. Uh, yeah. And uh, now, as I said, uh, you're you're you're. Your population of children ranks number two in the world in terms of obesity. So uh, things have changed. They've changed actually uh, in most of the world in the last 35 years. Yeah. And uh, to where now China you know, has a horrible obesity problem. 12% uh, of the people are diabetic from what they eat and half are pre-diabetic in China. And that all happened uh, from a time 35 years ago when they ate 90% of their diet is rice. As, as uh, many of the your friends, uh, uh, grandparents, uh, ninety percent of their diet came from pasta. Yeah. You know, some type some type of wheat uh, uh, or, or grain product was ninety percent of the diet of your grandmother and great grandmother. And uh, back back in those times, they didn't know, you know, breast cancer, or colon cancer, or prostate cancer, or rheumatoid arthritis, or multiple sclerosis. Uh, these were extremely rare diseases and confined to your aristocrat aristocrats. That you had back then, yeah, sure. Yeah. And so all this has changed within the memory of people who are still alive. That that's the interesting thing. Uh, uh, you know, I, I mentioned to you, I'm nearly seventy years old, and I can remember a world that was different. And now my children, who are in their thirties and forties, uh, they don't remember. They don't have that kind of uh, uh, personal knowledge. I mean, they hear about these things, and of course, the grandkids have no idea. Uh, what things used to be. That's, that's history books. But there are still people alive in Italy. Yeah. Uh, 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 in fact, uh, in Sardonia. Sardinia. Do I pronounce? Yes, Sardinia, yes. Okay. Uh, Italy, that, that's one of what are known as one of the blue zones uh, in the world. And uh, when National Geographic um, uh, interviewed various populations around. Uh, Dan Butner is the man's name. He happens to be a friend of mine. Uh, he wrote he wrote about the blue zones in National Geographic, and uh, he went around uh, to different parts of the world. And uh, Sard uh, Sardinia, Italy, uh, was one of the blue zones where the number of centari uh, centarians, people who live over a hundred years old, uh, was uh, you know ten times greater than the general population. He found. Uh, he found a, another blue zone in Okinawa, Japan, another one in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Southern California among the Seventh-day Adventists. And now since then, they've added two more blue zones, uh, one in uh, Costa Rica and one in Greece. And these populations all share the fact that they eat the old diet. Now, I know that's, uh, you know that, that, that report was done in 2006 or 10 years later. And things uh, I'm sure have dra changed drastically. Maybe. Even, you know, why not? You know, in ten years with with uh, the internet and with uh, cable TV, everybody wants to be like Americans. Yeah, always uh, true. <laughs> or uh, you know, like Americans aren't the richest people in the world anymore, but they want to be like the richest people in the world. And so when you have that information, you know, it's easy to sell people uh, on the good life. 
And what I, they end up uh, doing is, in addition to you know having all this good food, they also have big hospitals and big cancer centers and big heart disease centers all over Italy. Uh, wherever you go, I bet, I bet uh, wherever you go, and especially in your big cities, you've got new cardiac centers, new cancer centers, uh, new diabetes centers, brand new hospitals, every place. That's the only growing segment of the U.S. economy is the uh, medical care, health care segment, uh, because people are getting sicker and we're borrowing money from China to pay for our sickness. And, you know, I don't know what your economy is like over there, but I have oh. no doubt your, your hospitals are thriving. No, it's not. No, economy in Italy is not going very well. I mean, uh, I'm, not, I'm not an expert, but I know that we are, um, there is a huge, huge uh -huh. crisis and, uh, and it's, not, it's not exactly... The, going very very well but i know that we could do better you know following your your advices honestly we could yeah, be well, less sick honestly that's why i, I want uh, to spread you know the message because also i'm having some cases in my family not, not my family but other people that are not well and it would and sometimes it's so it would be so easier just to tell them a couple of advices why 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 are you still eating that why don't you just but uh, you know it's so it's so sometimes people are just so lazy let's say lazy they say oh it's not happening to me why do i have to stop to eat meat why do i have to stop eating dairy because at the end of the day at least i think they taste good so people they they say okay yeah they're still there in the in the, in the meat section in the supermarket so why uh, it's not that I'm uh, not anything is going to change if I'm not going to buy that uh, yeah so do you know what I mean? Well, the the attitude I've had to take because uh, this has been something that's been obvious to me for almost forty years why people are sick. I mean, I yeah everything I'm t everything I'm telling you now. I yeah, know. Uh, about the cause and the cure of disease I knew 40 years ago and was practicing. Uh, I used to think the world would, once they understand, understood this profound message uh, about uh, why people are so sick, I mean, overnutrition um, insofar as cause of death and disease far outweighs undernutrition in the world. That, that's been that way for 15 years. I thought people would just uh, run for this message, uh, but that is absolutely untrue. Uh, however, however, and this is the good part, uh, and the part that you should dwell on and why you should try and show this uh, this interview we're doing to people you care about is that um, even though most may not be able to listen, for some, you'll open their eyes. And for some people, uh, and I get, I get emails all the time from Italy and other parts of the world, uh, people suffering. They don't want to suffer anymore. They don't want to be fat anymore. They don't want to have indigestion anymore. They... You know, they've had one heart surgery, they don't want to have another. So the, these are people in your community, friends, relatives, uh, family. And even though most of them won't listen and some of them may, may, may call you bad names and <laughs> think bad thoughts of you, every once in a while somebody listens. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, when, when they listen, what happens is everything that we're talking about happens to them. They get their health back. Uh, they get their energy back. They can play with their grandkids again. I mean, you know, everything that they want, they can have for nothing. And of course, that's part of the problem. Yeah, yeah, it's you know, for, just for nothing. My, my, my little victory, and then and then I'll let you go, is that my father, he's an healthy man, you know, tennis instructor and that blah, blah, blah. But he has this, you know, the thing that he's always eating. He was always eating a lot of cheese. Because in Italy, we have this thing that after every meal, even if we had meat or fish, we still have our big piece of cheese and he's like you know the addiction that my father has and then like i started i think like, a year ago to start to show him like documentary like fork over knives you were in there too and he was like oh, no, i don't care i don't care blah 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 and then you know my mom the other day she told me you know what we're almost not buying cheese anymore and i was like yeah, yeah so it's working <laughs> Yeah, it's it's working. Yeah, and, just and the tiny, tiny steps, of course, because at the beginning, people they don't want to hear that. But you know, if just they start to know that in Italy, especially now, the vegan trend is starting to become a trend. It's it's not like in London or in the United States, but they start to talk about health, the connection between you know food and diseases. So probably they started to say, oh, maybe Lorenza is right. Maybe there is a connection. Oh, okay, let's let's listen to her. Yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? Yeah. Anyway, and, so, so 
thank you very yeah. much. You know, it was it was really really amazing to talk to you. You're my favorite doctor, and you know, I just found out that there is an amazing, um, you know, the Cornell uh, nutrition plant based uh, 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 degree from uh, Colin Campbell. You know, uh, and I, and and I really save I'm saving money because I would love to 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 do that, and I and I, and I know that you're one of the people that are working there as well, right? Well, I do have a lecture that a lecture. I did probably 10 years ago that's in there. Okay. But, you know, the other thing I would, uh, you know, just as a, as an effort to extend, uh, yeah. you know, our friendship, the friendship that I just made with your, your viewers, is I'd like you to know that, that our website uh, is extensive in terms of uh, education. Yeah. We, have prof we have professional classes there, but we have so much free information. Yeah. Uh, people are always shocked by the fact that drmcdougall.com uh, gives you, you know, 500 free recipes and a whole plan and a discussion board and, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, we have, oh, probably 50 or more uh, videos on YouTube, maybe 100. I don't know how many I have. I probably have a hundred videos on of YouTube. Of course, I, I will. I will translate. Uh, I will put all the the subtitles in Italian of this interview, and I will talk about you, and uh, and maybe you talk about me and my vlog as well. So we'll so we we'll talk right. about the Italian people living in the states as well. Maybe we'll 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 read about the, you as well. Anyway, it was it was really amazing. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it so much. It was my pleasure. So I have a I have a lovely Sunday in California, right? Yes, we're in California. That's okay, where, lucky that's where I you. Now. Maybe I will move to LA in a couple of months, and I cannot wait. <laughs> well, good enough. It'd be nice to meet you in person. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Well, Have thank a you. Bye. Bye. Day. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks.